The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. You are who you are. Have you always been? And how did you get that way? Tonight, we'll explore the latest thinking on where personality comes from and whether it can change over time. Then, with monarch butterflies now joining the international endangered list, we'll examine concern about an impending insect crisis. It's Tuesday, November 1st, and that's next on The Agenda. There's long been a debate about which is more influential in determining human behavior, nature or nurture. But how far does that get us in understanding what shapes personality or whether personality changes over time, intentionally or just by virtue of the school of life? With us for the latest thinking on all of that, we welcome in Edinburgh, Scotland, Michelle Luciano, behavioral geneticist and associate professor at the University of Edinburgh. In Sacramento, California, Madeline Lenhausen, a recent PhD psychology graduate from the University of California, Davis, and a quantitative researcher. And in Waterville, Maine, Chris Soto, professor and chair of psychology at Colby College and director of the Colby Personality Lab. And it's great to welcome you three to TVO tonight. Chris, I'm going to put you to work right away. What tools do psychologists use to understand someone's personality? So psychologists typically study and measure personality in terms of the big five personality traits. Uh, those are extroversion, the extent to which someone is um, outgoing, talkative, assertive, uh, and sociable, as opposed to being more uh, socially and emotionally reserved. Uh, agreeableness, which is the extent to which someone is compassionate, kind, and trusting of others, as opposed to being more blunt and argumentative. Uh, conscientiousness, the extent to which someone is hardworking, organized, and responsible, as opposed to being a bit more disorganized uh, and lazy. Neuroticism, the extent to which someone is uh, prone to experiencing negative emotions like anxiety and sadness, as opposed to being more emotionally stable. And openness to experience, so the extent to which someone is curious, creative, and artistic, as to being more traditional and conventional. That's great. That's that. We actually had a graphic made up of this. And Sheldon, let me ask you just to put the graphic up right now anyway, just so we can remind everybody. Okay, this is where it all starts. The big five. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And that's the stuff we're going to be talking about over the next half an hour. Madeline, maybe you could pick up the story. How much of our personality is inherent and how much of it is our experiences in life? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, a good amount of personality is definitely inherited. Um, some traits may be more than others, like uh, openness to experience, for example, uh, that is has a great deal of inheritance that goes along with it, especially um, due to facets of it that are related to intellect and intelligence that are very inherited. Um, but there is still a wide array of the environment that goes into our personality as well. All right. If part of the personality is inherited, Michelle, maybe I can bring you in here. How are our genes connected to our personality? Yes. So twin and family studies have shown us that around half of the variation in personality traits in the population, so the differences we see between people, is due to our genes and around half is due to our environment. So uh, what uh, modern research is doing is trying to identify specific genes that are associated with personality traits. And here we look at millions of genetic variants across the genome, and we associate them with different uh, scores or levels of a personality trait. So the most studied personality trait has been neuroticism and we've we've found lots of uh, genes or genetic variants that are associated with neuroticism i'm going to but ask they a very still don't yes sorry i'm going to ask a very politically incorrect question and that is neuroticism is there are there groups in particular i'm thinking of demographics that uh, have a disproportionate amount of that let's let's ask that uh yeah so that's something that uh, our so genetic research doesn't look at differences 
between populations and usually so with these genetic studies that I'm referring to most of them have been done in populations with European ancestry so the results really generalize to those populations so uh, that's not an area of research in terms of uh, mean levels of differences between uh, different uh, groups that I've, I've looked at but we know that there is a uh, sex difference in mean neuroticism. So women uh, tend to be higher in neuroticism than men. And uh, that's, that's, that's a well-established finding. And it, there's also links there. So in terms of anxiety and depression, which neuroticism relates to, uh, anxiety and depression is also more prevalent in women than men. Madeline, it, it's apparently an empirically provable, well-established fact, but are you allowed to say it today? <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of interesting too, because, um, women tend to, um, compare themselves to other women often and men can tend to compare themselves to other men. Um, but so when they're reporting on their own neuroticism, saying how neurotic they are, it, it makes sense with a group of women. We just tend to be more neurotic. I don't, it seems, it could seem politically incorrect, but there's a lot of research to back it up. Okay. Chris, let me get you back in here. Can you give examples of what experiences could affect our personality? Sure. So the main types of experiences uh, that have been looked at um, by personality psychologists and the relations with life outcomes are experiences in school and in work on the one hand, and experiences in close relationships on other on the other hand. So um, on the school and work side, you can imagine that staying in school for longer, uh, it tends to make people more conscientious because they have additional practice uh, in you know, completing assignments, turning things in on time, staying organized, and also in openness to experience. If you think in particular about uh, higher education, uh, People are intellectually curious, they're pursuing new ideas, they're learning about new things, and that tends to expand their minds a bit. Uh, and in terms of careers, it really depends what kind of job you're going into. So if you go into a career like sales, where it calls for a lot of social behavior and interacting with others, you know that might tend to make people more extroverted, where if someone goes into the arts or sciences, it really continues to bring out that curiosity and creativity. Chris, let me do a follow-up with you. And, and those examples you just gave don't sound like they are off the charts dramatic. It sounds like the stuff of everyday life. Do we assume that if you are experiencing off the charts dramatic, maybe the death of a spouse, uh, or conversely, a, a, you know, a happy day, like a, a wedding or something like that, that the impact would be even more? Well, in the short term, on behavior, you would expect those effects, but not really rising to the level of personality change. So, yeah, you can imagine kind of daily ups and downs and that affecting what behavior you show on a day-to-day -day basis. But people are generally pretty good at recognizing that those are just temporary influences on their behavior that don't really represent changes in their personality. Uh, whereas if you're looking at actual personality trait change, that tends to take... Uh, months, years, or decades. So happening gradually, it does happen, um, but it doesn't tend to be sudden. Okay, let me ask Michelle. The, um, I, I guess this is sort of the most typical question that most people ask, which is, say you got identical twins, and they grow up in the same house, uh, under the cir same circumstances, they go to the same school, you know, the same this, the same that, sometimes they even get dressed the same by their parents. <laughs> Tell us why they wouldn't, at the end of the day, necessarily have the same personality. Yes, yeah, so as I was mentioning earlier, twin research has shown us that around half of the variation in the, the differences we see in personality in the population is due to genes, but the other half is due to the environment. And it's not actually the shared environment, so most people consider aspects of the shared environment being your socioeconomic class or your family environment. It's the non-shared experiences that twins have that is uh, having more of an effect on their personality. And what's a non-shared experience? 
so a non well <laughs> this is the big question uh, th there's potentially uh, thousands of non-shared experience p uh, twins could have, right? Uh, it could be something as simple as uh, having different uh, friends, uh, illnesses, for instance, that one twin has that another doesn't. It can, it, it's anything, even just chance occurrences that that happen um, that, that just affect one twin uh, and not the other can set, I guess, that twin on a personality path that's different from their identical twin. And these are uh, factors that we don't really have a good grasp of individually what they might represent, because it's, it's very com complex. Even one's parenting environment, although we might consider it to be the same, identical twins can still react differently to the same parenting experience. So it's about perceptions differing as well. So it's quite complex in terms of identifying specific aspects of the environment that influence one's personality. I guess, Madeline, the $64,000 question here is, how well do we really know ourselves? What do you find on that? <laughs> Oh, Steve, that is the golden question. Um, I, I think that's what a lot of people want to know. We we think we know ourselves really well because, you know, personality is these relatively stable patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that we have and who has more access to that information other than ourselves. Um, and researchers show we, we know ourselves pretty accurately, but it's hard to say how accurately because if you compare how we see ourselves to how our friends or how our partners see ourselves, um, the, the perceptions don't completely line up. And we could just assume that maybe our partner sees us incorrectly and that's why those perceptions aren't lining up. Or we could think that maybe our partner sees some behavior or actions that we don't internalize as part of our personality. Um, yeah. Well, let me do a follow-up with you on that. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to put this to you because I assume you are the youngest among the four of us here. And does it go without saying that you know yourself, you know, to a certain extent right now, but 20 years from now, you're going to know yourself a lot better? Is that is that a given? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think that just comes along with having more experiences, having more life experiences, meeting new people, interacting with people differently. And through these interactions, we learn more about ourselves. We learn how we react to situations differently. We learn how we react to people differently. And that can be used to inform ourselves more about ourselves. Chris, are there particular personalities that have a, pre a predictable trajectory? Let's put it that way. In terms of their change over time? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So the typical pattern of personality development over the lifespan is mostly good news. So once you kind of make it past the transition into puberty, uh, most people tend to become more agreeable, more conscientious, and more emotionally stable across the next, say, five decades from the late teens uh, into the 60s. So, so people are becoming more uh, socially and emotionally mature. Not everybody shows that particular pattern, unfortunately, but most people do. Hmm. Okay, and Madeline, let me come back to you on this one. Some of your studies, I gather, at how we perceive our own personalities versus how others perceive us, I, I guess I want to know whether the, the delta, the gulf between those two things, can you tell whether it's getting bigger or smaller over time? Yeah, well, so... It depends a lot on um, the closeness of people to each other. So if you look at how um, friends perceive each other versus roommates versus romantic partner versus spouse, um, the longer and more intimate the relationship, the the smaller that gap gets. Um, and that could be both because, you know, people are learning people more by watching their behavior, by seeing them in situations that they wouldn't have seen them before, or because say, I myself am expressing more about my personality to my partner, and they also pick up on that. Well, now, here's a COVID-related question, and that is, and maybe I'll get all of you to weigh in on this, uh, it depends on the closeness of the relationship. We've just gone through two and a half years where trying to have closer relationships with people has been really hard to do, either because we've been locked down, or if you're a senior and, and you know, living in a senior's residence, uh, you're not permitted to have visitors, 
We've been doing a lot of trying to get to know each other on Zoom uh, over the last two and a half years. Yes, it's opening up now, but I wonder who's going to go first on this one. Uh, Michelle, can you help us understand whether or not those, the last two and a half years have been problematic in terms of our getting to know ourselves and others better? Yeah, I, I would imagine that that uh, would have effect. I haven't done any COVID research myself, but um, perhaps uh, one of the others on the panel is familiar with some of the studies, which I'm sure have taken place. Okay, Chris, you want to pick up on that, Chris? Sure. So there has been some very interesting research that's come out uh, during the pandemic to see whether it has affected people's personality development. Um, and it's kind of a tale of two halves. So there was some research that came out very early on during the first, first few months to see if the pandemic was making people, for example, more neurotic, more anxious or depressed. And uh, people did report that in the short term, they were feeling more negative emotions, but they didn't see it as a reflection on their personality. Kind of similar to what I said earlier, that people were good about recognizing that it was a situational characteristic that was affecting their behavior in the short term, but not necessarily affecting their personality. But as things have dragged on, that seems to have changed over time. So now people have seen kind of longer term effects on their behavior, and that's translating into actual personality change. So it is unfortunate, but especially if you look at younger folks, people in their teens and 20s, it does seem like they are a bit less agreeable, conscientious, and emotionally stable uh, right now than you would have expected if there hadn't been the pandemic. And that may be uh, a result of kind of decreased face-to-face -face social interaction and the kind of social and emotional skills that we develop from that. Madeline, I don't know if you're in that demographic. You look like you're in your 20s, so I'm going to ask you this question. But uh, have you found what Chris just said to be the case? Um, yeah, I, I guess partly. But again, it's a hard thing to know when uh, you actually incorporate a situation into your personality. I don't know if if I was reporting on my personality, if I would say these things. Maybe a little higher neuroticism, actually, probably for sure. Um, I think that one would get me. <laughs> and maybe you could pick up on this. How do personalities actually change over time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because, you know, personality development, personality maturation is different from personality change, where development is more of this maturation where you become more agreeable and less neurotic um, and more conscientious over time. You kind of turn into that you know, mature adult that we all want to be. Um, but actual personality change in a way that deviates from that normative trend, um, it varies a lot. Uh, most change, or a lot of change that does happen technically, or it has to be volitional, and that means people have to want to change, and people have to commit to that change um, pretty intensely for it to actually take effect and not just revert back to their normal levels. Hmm. Michelle, have you noticed a genetic cause and effect over the last two and a half years? So there has been some work, but uh, genetic studies are very uh, labor-intensive. Um, the Nothing has been reported, for instance, just over the last two years of COVID in terms of longitudinal change. But we do know from previous research that genetic effects are, are very stable uh, over the lifetime, so genetic effects on personality, uh, whereas the environmental effects uh, tend to differ more uh, as people age. So new environmental influences may be coming into a play that affect one's personality, whereas the genes are kind of stable from very, very early in life. Okay, I take your point. Chris, what if somebody really wanted to change their personality? What are the external factors that uh, either make that more difficult to do or prevent it from happening? Yeah, so there's some very interesting research in this area of volitional personality change. Uh, one thing that's important to note up front is that most people would like to change something about their personality traits. So if you ask people, you know, is there something, and you ask them in terms of the big five, a lot of people would say, yeah, I would like to be a little bit more extroverted, agreeable, conscientious, emotionally stable, uh, and intellectually curious. Um, then the next question you might ask is whether they can actually do that. And there is encouraging evidence along those lines. So if you ask people now, what is the one thing that you would most like to change about your personality? Uh, and then you follow up with them a half a year from now and see how they've actually changed. There's a better than 50-50 chance that they will have changed in the direction that they want to change. 
Hmm. Um, and then there do seem to be some specific things that can be done to make that kind of volitional change more likely. So if you kind of coach people through the process of taking this very abstract goal that they might have of, I'd like to be more extroverted, and then you ask them to come up with specific plans of what are some particular situations where you could ask, ask uh, behave more extrovertedly, and how could you do that specifically, and then you have them kind of follow themselves over time. Uh, if they follow through uh, and make those plans and follow through on those plans, then there is a, a even better chance that they will change in the desired direction over time. Can you just follow up on that? What's what's one piece of advice you would give to somebody who wanted to be more extroverted, but who is by nature introverted and finds it painful to be extroverted? Yeah, I think there are two very difficult steps that, that are key. The first one is taking that, that very abstract goal of just becoming more extroverted and translating it into specific situations and specific behaviors. So think to yourself, where, what are some situations when I tend to be shy and introverted? How could I act in a different way that would be a bit more extroverted? Maybe it's you know striking up a conversation uh, with a cashier when I'm checking out at the store, or starting a conversation if I'm sitting in class or uh, at the start of the workday with someone sitting near me. Uh, so there's that part of taking the abstract goal and making it more concrete. And then the second part is just persisting over time, because for a lot of us, it's easy to change our behavior in the short term for a few days. But if we really want to see personality change, it's a matter of sticking with it over a course of weeks and months until it becomes the new normal, until it becomes our new habitual pattern of behavior. And it's only at that point that I'd really be comfortable saying that we've seen actual personality change. Okay, Madeline, uh, it, l let me put it this way. Over the last five years or so, uh, one could detect a massive uptick in the lack of empathy uh, by many, many people around the world. Uh, we see it on our evening newscasts far too frequently. And I guess uh, I, guess I wanna ask you, I, I realize it's not one of the big five specifically, but what can you do to get people to be more empathetic in the face of uh, so much of the toxicity that exists in our in our in both our countries these days? Oh wow, that is that's a great question. Um, yeah, in the last five years, that's interesting. I see over the pandemic, it it makes sense being more socially isolated. You know, um, sometimes it's easier to be hateful and lack empathy behind a screen. Um, if you don't see someone's face, if you don't feel their social cues and feel the emotion. Um, so one way I think, one thing that really helps empathy is, is literally being in that face-to-face -face situation where you can feel the emotions that someone else is feeling because behind a screen, it's really easy to not know what someone else is feeling and not care. Mm -hmm. Michelle, do you find that people actually want to change their personalities? Or are they more more likely to prefer just being who they are? I I can only give you my impression based on the the people I know and speak to, uh, but I think uh, I echo what other people have have said. There are particular aspects of our personalities that. Um, we wish to change. Um, I, I can speak for myself as well. Uh, and so I was very interested to hear Chris talk about success people can have when you, you actually put your mind to it and, um, and um, yeah, keep reaffirming and, and trying to do those spe specific things, for instance, that extroverted people do and pushing yourself a bit. Um, so, so yes, I guess I, I, I think that's a fair comment to make that most people probably do have aspects of their personality that they'd like to, to, to change. Oh, should we go down this road here? Okay. <laughs> Michelle, what would you like to change about yourself? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I got two great experts here who are pr pr happy to give you lots of advice. Yes, I, I think I could do, having two um, children, primary school age children, I think I could do with a bit more um, patient agreeableness at times. <laughs> I get that. Chris, you want to weigh in on that too? Uh, I guess for me, it would be becoming more extroverted. I feel like I've got the conscientiousness thing down. I can manage my responsibilities. Um, but uh, being a bit more uh, social, outgoing, and energetic, who wouldn't go for that? What's preventing you from doing that right now? 
I mean, I think I do have a kind of natural genetic disposition towards being more shy and introverted. It's something that I've tried to work on a bit over time. Uh, maybe I've made some progress, but certainly could stand to make some more. Well, the fact that you agreed to come on television and talk about this suggests to me <laughs> that you are, you are aware of it and you are taking steps to do something about it. Is that fair, a fair observation? Yeah, certainly my initial reaction to the invitation was to be a little bit uh, kind of shy and, and nervous, but uh, I was willing to step out of my comfort zone and, and give it a shot. There you go. And has the experience been as horrific as you feared it would be? No, it definitely could have been worse. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> Madeline, how about you? Do you want to add to that? Uh, I guess I would say I, I would like to be a little more assertive. Uh, you know, just take the friendliness down a, a notch and, uh, you know, take more of a leadership role. And, uh, okay, give us some steps about if that's what you've identified, how would you like to make that happen? Oh, my gosh. I, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I think that's why I'm, I'm not there, because I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michelle, if you can't change uh, what's genetic, what do you do then? Uh Okay, so I think uh, uh, just a point of clarification about what we know about the genetics underlying personality is that uh, genes don't work um, deterministically. So uh, with personality, there's potentially thousands of genes that have very, very small effect on influencing our personality. So uh, it, it's it's probabilistic. So, and of course, when you add the environment into the mix, genes can interact with your environment. So I, I don't think, um, although there's half of the, the variation we see in the population is due to genes, uh, that's not saying that there's anything truly fixed about our personalities and, and that I think there is, um, you know, potential for the environment to also um, exert uh, quite a lot of influence there as well, but as been uh, as has been alluded to, I mean we did we are born with these temperaments that kind of stay with us <laughs> <laughs> for our lives. But but yeah, there's 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 room I think to um, kind of wriggle. <laughs> and, and just finally, the, the next the next steps in your research in understanding the the genetic connection, where are they taking yeah. you? Do you suppose? Yeah, so um, to date we've focused on common genetic variants. So these are variants, uh, as the name suggests, that are common in the population. And we know that uh, these common variants, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, don't explain all of the genetic variants in personality. So the next, or one of the next steps at least, is to look at rare variants, and uh, these are uh, very uncommon variants in the population, but it's possible that they have larger effects than the common variants, which to date have, have explained very, very small um, amounts of variation in in the, the genetics um, contributing to a trait. So that's one avenue of hmm. future research, looking at rare genetic variants. Well, I know you all accepted our invitation to come on this program and share your expertise. I'm not sure any of you thought you were going to be on my psychiatrist's couch during the course of this discussion, but I'm glad that you were all such great sports about putting up with it, and we are grateful for your time very much. Uh, thanks to Madeline Lenhausen, to Chris Soto, and to Michelle Luciano. Appreciate you being on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Tomorrow on the Agenda... It, there's a relatively simple explanation, and my plea to the government of Canada would be get off your derrieres, start spending the money more quickly and more efficiently than you've ever done in the past over the previous seven years, because whatever you're doing is not working. Our warship contract is now a couple of decades should have been signed. Same is true of the new fighters, same is true of whole host of equipment capabilities and training and recruiting efforts. So, um, you know, get rid of the gatekeepers and start getting on with it, quite frankly. That's tomorrow on The Agenda. While insects don't generally get a lot of love, the truth is that the planet's ecosystem depends on every creepy crawly out there. But researchers have been raising the alarms for some time now that all is not right in the bug world. Here to help us understand what's going on, let's welcome, in Brooklyn, New York, Oliver Millman, author of The Insect Crisis, 
the fall of the tiny empires that run the world. He's also an environment reporter for The Guardian U.S. In our nation's capital, Heather Karuba, associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Ottawa. And here in our studio, Antonia Guidotti, entomologist at the Royal Ontario Museum. And Antonia, it's great to have you here in our studio and to our guests in Points Beyond. Thank you for joining us as well. Okay, entomologist, what's that? Let's start there. Oh, that's a good question. It's uh, someone who studies insects, simply put. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. We also do arachnids, which means the spiders, scorpions, things like that. So you're the perfect guest to have here. Hmm. Oliver, as an environment reporter, I suspect you've been asked this before, but I gotta, I gotta pile on with this question. When was the moment you realized that bugs were your life and you needed to write a book about them? <laughs> uh, that is a great question, Steve. I mean, I think um, if somebody told me a few years ago my first book would be on insects, I probably wouldn't have believed them uh, as an environment reporter. You're kind of drawn to the big kind of flashy things of this world, uh, you know, polar bears, the Amazon rainforest, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, kind of things like this. Um, uh, but it was from speaking to scientists and looking at various kind of pieces of research coming out, it seemed from about 2017, 2018 onwards, we just had this kind of avalanche of research coming out showing these kind of huge population declines in uh, in insects in, in, in several parts of the world. And it became clear to me that this was a kind of a big untold silent crisis that was unfolding that we didn't really know uh, the full details of as yet, but uh, it was something that I wanted to um, explore further. So I got to, to walk around in entomologist's shoes for a couple of years and find out what was going on. And that is what we will explore over the next uh, nearly half hour here. Antonia, let's bring it home. What kinds of insects do we normally see here in the province of Ontario? Oh, there are thousands of different species of mm -hmm. insects in Ontario. Um, because I got to tell you, I don't see a lot of many more. You know, well, you have to look in the right places. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go for a walk, go to the park, even in your backyard. Sometimes in your house, uh, insects are everywhere. There may not be as many of them because I think um, Oliver's correct. The insect declines are real; they're happening. But there are insects everywhere that you go. You just have to keep your eyes open and. Uh, be curious. So Heather, that's not our imagination, because uh, you know I've heard lots of people say, the bugs splashing on my windshield when I drive up north doesn't happen anymore. My grill on the car is not covered with them anymore. They really are disappearing. Yeah, there's more and more reports from different areas of the world, um, both in not, like protected areas where we wouldn't necessarily expect to see declines, but also in areas where we would, like you know where humans live as well. But yeah, more and more there's. Um, substantial declines happening in different parts and different for different kinds of insects as well. And one in particular are you researching right now? So yeah, we're really interested in the monarch butterfly um, and looking at um, figuring out some aspects of why it's declining around Ottawa and then also how climate change is going to affect it. Okay, Oliver, have you noticed this as well? I have, yeah. I, I since especially since started writing the book, I've kind of try to notice insects around me a bit more because I think we don't really think of insects that often. When we do, we often think of them as being irritating or, or we want them away from us. Um, but I've kind of started to think more about um, what I used to see and what I see now. And, uh, you know, driving around for a week in uh, Montana, for example, a very sparsely populated state in the US um, should be full of bugs. Uh, I ended the week, there was nothing on the windshield of, of the car, which is quite incredible when you think about it like that. Um, yeah, I noticed, uh, you know, I used to love kind of rolling over logs as a kid and looking at ants and things uh, under there. And um, yeah, I kind of worry that my, my kids aren't going to experience that to the same degree. There will always be insects, of course. There will be always more insects than us uh, around. But um, certainly there are changes um, that I think um, everyday people can can recognize. Well, Antonio, we've got to figure out why this is a problem, because I suspect if you ask people, you can go up to the cottage and no mosquitoes or no house flies are going to bother you the whole time you're there. People might sign up for that deal right away. Now explain to us why that's a problem. Well, because those insects are really important parts of the food chain. Um, I think if you went up to the cottage and there were no birds, you'd be alarmed. Right. Um, oh, we like birds. We like we birds. We like the sound they make. We, we like that they fly by and give us pleasure. But a lot of birds depend on insects, especially when they're baby chicks, for sustenance. They need insects to survive. 
So if there aren't insects for them to feed on, then they're gonna starve. We want birds. And on the other side, even in the water, fish feed on a lot of insect larvae. There are a lot of insects that start out in the water, like those mosquitoes, like dragonflies. And if fish don't have food to eat, then they're not gonna survive either. So we want fish, we want birds. There's so many small mammals, even reptiles and amphibians that feed on insects. They're a very important part of our ecosystem and you may not like them at the cottage, but um, we gotta they're important. Yeah. Okay, uh, Oliver, I wanna do a quote from your book here about this because one of the things that you point to as affecting the size of the insect population these days is climate change. So Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this graphic with the quote from Oliver's book. Climate change's cruel dexterity, you write, means that over decades, it can liquefy the glacier homes of stoneflies, over years, strip plants of nutrients needed by grasshoppers, or over just an hour or two, barbecue a species of rare bee. For all the other damage we are currently inflicting on insects, at some point, the insect crisis might be more easily seen as one of the many limbs of the climate crisis. It's interesting you put it that way because, uh, you know, climate change is something that everybody's aware of now, and we know the kind of damage that it can do, broadly speaking, but I'm not sure anybody's ever, or not too many people outside of your line of work, think about what it does to the insect population. Do we need to do that now? We do. I think there was an assumption that insects would somehow be um, slightly removed from the effects of the climate crisis. I mean, there are so many of them. They're quite adaptable after all. Um, uh, but there is more and more research coming out showing that insects are affected by climate change. They live in fairly narrow bands of temperature. If you think about bumblebees, for example, they're kind of permanently sewn into their, their winter coats, aren't they? Um, they? They can't deal with a, a temperature that's kind of vastly uh, increased from what, what it is now. And we're seeing that effect in uh, Canada and the US, that species of bumblebee are declining. Uh, and that those that are affected by climate change and um, uh, warmer temperatures are, are doing worse than than any other. So um, is that effect? I think it's important to point out that there are always going to be winners and losers. And unfortunately, the kinds of insects that will do quite well in a kind of warmer, damper world um, are mosquitoes. Uh, I mean, the range of mosquitoes carrying diseases is expected to expand globally due to climate change. So unfortunately, we are um, creating a world less hospitable for the insects we tend to, to love. Um, uh, um, Monarch butterflies were mentioned earlier, that they're, they're one that's suffering because of climate change. We tend to really adore them. Uh, bumblebees, uh, we really like them. They're not doing very well because of climate change. But uh, mosquitoes will do OK in, in many respects. Um, and that's not really uh, a kind of trade off I think many of us would like to see. And Tony, you agree with that? We're going to get more of, the, more of the kind of bugs we don't want and fewer of the ones we truly need? Well, I mean, that's sort of happening in Ontario already. There are species of mosquito that can carry diseases that are moving in to southern Ontario. There are records of those already. Like what? So um, there are Aedes species. Um, that's the genus. Um, and they can carry things like Zika or chikungunya or other diseases that we may not be familiar with normally as part of Ontario and they could easily, uh, they are coming in, so. These are not good things? No. Got it. Heather, you told us earlier that monarch butterflies are your specialty, so tell us what climate change is doing to them. Well, um, it's quite complicated for the, for the monarch butterfly because of its complex life cycle. And so we're trying to figure out um, where and how climate change is affecting it. So it's basically getting you know, influenced by climate change throughout its reign from, you know, in Canada and all the way to Mexico. And so, you know, it's been affected by summer temperatures in the U.S. and its breeding range, but then it's also affected by warmer winter temperatures in Mexico. Um, we think it's probably affecting its milkweed, its host plant. And so we're trying to figure out all of these different pathways that climate change is going to affect the monarch butterfly and figure out, you know, what is the most important driver there and what do we need to focus on? What about land use? What's climate change doing to land use? Well, I mean, climate change has a lot of different interacting factors with land use change. Um, a lot of things like forest fires, um, you know, the way that forests are rebounding or regenerating. And so there's a lot of different interacting factors. That's probably the one of the most complex um, aspects of this that we really don't have a good handle on is how climate change is interacting with other factors like land use change. Yeah, Oliver, maybe you could follow up on that. As you look at the, at the cities and the increasing urbanization that's taking place, 
uh, all over the world, but certainly here in the province of Ontario, do we assume that every time a, a farmer's field gets taken over by a developer and a condo goes up, that's not good for the bugs? I mean, broadly speaking, yes, but I mean, there are accommodations you can make. I mean, there are some um, farming practices uh, being adopted in uh, the European Union and North Africa, for example, where you have these kind of wildlife corridors going through fields where there are kind of um, fringing plants, wildflowers that allow bugs to kind of cling on, survive in the margins. But yeah, generally speaking, the, the model of development in Canada and the US has one, been one of monocultural farming. Uh, where you raise <laughs> meadows rich with insects and other life and make them into single crops, so soy or corn or, or wherever that may be, uh, with, with little kind of fringing plants that, uh, at the borders to, to support insect life. The same with um, urban development as well. We tend to want to get rid of messy weeds and, and, and plants we don't like in places we don't like them. Uh, and that's what insects need to kind of cling on. And so we're kind of creating a world that's quite kind of uniform and bland for insects. There's not much for them to eat, uh, not not many kind of opportunities for them to move and breed and so on. So, yeah, our, our model of development is quite problematic when it comes to sustaining insect life. This is quite counterintuitive, actually, Antonio, isn't it? The stuff that we really think we need to get rid of is the stuff that at the end of the day is is going to help us and that we need. Yes. We got a bit of a mindset that we got to change here, right? Well, it's a very human-centered mindset that we have that development is good um, because we need housing and things like that, but you're taking homes away from other species and we sort of need those other species. So, you know, there's only so many humans really that we can have on this planet before it's really catastrophic. Is that the right word? Okay, but let's talk to <laughs> political reality. If, if you want to get reelected, you got to have your eye on the prize, and at the moment, the prize is more housing, not more bugs. Fair to say? Yeah, but it's going to affect people. It's going to affect our air. It's going to affect our ecosystems. Everything's interconnected. And sure, you can have more housing for people, but all those insects and all those other life forms that share our space and share our environment, those need space too, because otherwise, we're going to suffer. Hmm. In the end, we will. Heather, are there other problematic aspects of this that say we haven't even considered or thought about yet? Well, I just wanted to add on that, like, of course, you know, development is our reality as, as our population grows, but there's ways of, you know, being smart in terms of the development. So in Ontario, the, right now, there's, you know, updated policy in terms of trying to move through a lot more housing, but there's been, you know, um, improvements recently about having developers add parkland and having, you know, other facilities and infrastructure in that are beneficial. And so, you know, when we move too fast and we're not being smart about it, then development, you know, for sure is going to have a negative impact, but we could be smarter about the way we're doing it. So I just wanted to add that in. No, I appreciate that. But again, that requires some political will to insist on not just towers going up, but parkland that is associated with them. Do you see that kind of political spirit in the country or the province today? Um, Less so. Like I said, I feel like we had in recent decades been making progress towards having developers, you know, as part of their agreement and contracts and having them contribute to building parkland in terms of um, improving lands around it and re reclamation. And so um, I realize right now there's huge pressure in terms of building fast. Um, we need housing, but, you know, we can't go backwards in terms of the way that we were um, again, putting more pressure on the developers to then um, build up and build parklands around the, the housing developments. Well, Antonia, let's do a what if here. What if we don't get this right? What if we're not smart enough to understand that this is a major problem? I mean, Oliver's book is titled The Insect Crisis. If we're dealing with a crisis here and we don't take the right steps, what kind of consequences are we looking at? Well, that's the question, isn't it? That's why uh, I asked gonna, it. <laughs> what's going to happen? Um, I think it's going to happen somewhat incrementally. We're going to start losing insect species one by one. And in many cases, we won't realize it until they're gone. Hmm. Um, it's happened with bumblebees. There's a few species that are extinct, some extirpated in Ontario. Extirpated, meaning? Meaning they're no longer found in the province, but they're not totally extinct from other locations. So if that starts to happen, you're going to have situations where the collapse of 
um, ecosystems happens, but it's going to happen very, very slowly, and we won't really realize that it's happening. Let me pick up on that with Oliver. Are there challenges out there that even you experts don't really have a full handle on yet that that we don't get? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we haven't even charted how many insect species there are out there in the world, for starters. I mean, there's about 1 million named species. There could be 5 million, 10 million. 20, 30 million. Um, no one's entirely sure. Uh, one scientist said to me, we've got, you know, 20,000 scientists studying one type of monkey and uh, t uh, um, what one scientist studying 20,000 types of insects. So there's a kind of big uh, a mismatch there in terms of resource. So we don't know what insects are doing around the world as yet uh, in every place in the world. We've got some pretty um, terrible glimpses in certain countries, but um, uh, we don't know what's going on in the tropics as, as, as much as we do in North America and um, uh, in Europe. So there is there is some gaps in our knowledge, but we're already seeing some evidence that um, crop yields are certain um, uh, certain foods are declining, are being limited because of the lack of pollination. Pollination is one of the huge things obviously insects provide to us. Uh, a, there was a study showing um, uh, yields of uh, things like cherries and blueberries are declining in British Columbia and, and the US um, due to uh, kind of constraints around pollination. So that, I think that's one of the big worries going forward this century. The United Nations has, has kind of warned there's going to be a, some sort of kind of food security issue uh, if these trends keep going forward where you have a kind of growing global population that needs more food that's pollinated at the time when pollination is becoming more stretched and hard to um, harder to get into the field. So I think that's one we've really got to keep an eye on is this issue of food security and, and nutrition because um, insects provide us all with all the great stuff on our plates, the colorful stuff, the nutritious stuff, the fruits and veg that um, we need to um, to be healthy. So um, I think that's certainly one that uh, governments are going to have to eventually get to grips with. Do you sign out of that as well, Antonia? Yeah, if you think about it, I mean, just recently we had Halloween. All those pumpkins are pollinated by bees, little bees, solitary bees. And um, if those bees aren't there to pollinate the pumpkins, we're not going to have pumpkins anymore. There's no other species that could come in and do that job. Well, you could hand pollinate, but that's a big field to hand pollinate hmm. pumpkins, um, and it's not very efficient. Better to have the bees do it. Yeah. OK. Uh, Heather, again, I want to return to the monarchs for you. Uh, besides the fact that we would no longer have the spectacular beauty of looking at monarchs do their thing if they were to disappear, what are the other consequences of that? Well, I mean, again, in terms of its migratory pathway, I mean, it's just been so interesting from a scientific point of view, right? We study the monarch in terms of, you know, how it migrates, how can it figure out how to migrate so far? I mean, also, monarch in its as a butterfly stage or the adult stage, it is a... It is a pollinator. It isn't a super efficient pollinator, but largely we use it to sort of capture other pollinators and the types of habitats that we're using to protect the monarch. So it sort of has this umbrella effect of if we're looking at how to best protect the monarch, we're going to also protect other pollinators that also need our help at the same time. So what it's sort of a win. win What part of the world do most monarchs live in? Uh, their biggest breeding range or biggest population, I would say, is in the U.S. Um, it, um, their northern range, like they just tip into Ontario and around Ottawa is probably the northern range um, part. And so the U.S. is the, the biggest contributor to their population. And you're in Ottawa right now. Are you noticing a significant difference from years past? Um, it like it really depends on the year, I have to say. So the, the really tricky thing with insect populations, which we haven't had a chance to talk about yet, is that they actually fluctuate a lot year to year. So that's why, you know, having historical data and stuff is really important because we need to figure out what's this longer term trend versus how do insect populations generally fluctuate? So I will say that yes, the monarch populations have been fluctuating a lot around Ottawa. Um, in some years, yes, we definitely see uh, lower numbers. And okay, the, the populations that we have today, one last one, uh, Heather, for you. The populations that we see nowadays, how do they compare to either the worst years that you've studied or the best years that you've studied? For the monarch specifically, you mean? Yeah. Well, so there's reports that, you know, the decline in the last 10 or so years is 20 to 70 percent lower numbers in monarch butterflies. And if you look back even further to the late 80s, it's like 80 percent. So a, quite a big decline over that time period. The problem is year to year. Again, there's a lot of fluctuating numbers up and down. And so 
Um, right this year, we had a pretty good year. So it's hard for me to say, looking back that many years, you know, how it compares directly. But overall, there's a huge decline in the monarch population over that time period. All right. Let's ask the question that I'm sure everybody who's watching or listening to this is asking now, and that is, what are we going to do about this? And to that end, we're going back to Oliver's book for a quote. Here we go. An enduring rehabilitation will require us to do things that will have no concrete measure of success other than avoiding consequences that are objectively bad. Just to maintain what appears to be the status quo will take a sustained effort involving lots of large and incremental changes, many of them out of sight to most people, to the way we develop land, produce food, and generate energy. But before all that, we need to show on a fundamental level that we care. Okay, let's pick up there. Oliver, do we care? <laughs> Not enough. No, we don't. I think uh, more and more people are kind of getting their heads around the idea that there's that we should save the bees. I mean, I think that's a kind of catch call that some people have kind of flocked to now. And we've seen some efforts uh, at a kind of local level to support monarch populations and, and other things. But on a broad level, we don't. I think that was one of the most interesting things in writing this book was to look at that kind of cultural question of what we value and what's important to us and, and how there's a huge discrepancy between those things. I mean, we spend so much time and effort and money on conser the conservation of the kind of big beasts of our world, you know, the, the rhinos and the elephants and the uh, so Sumatran tiger and orangutan and so on. I mean, these are wonderful creatures and it would be a horrible crime if we were to let them go extinct. But in terms of the impact on our lives from a selfish point of view, um, the loss of these creatures would be minimal. Uh, whereas the loss of insects, by one kind of estimate, uh, would uh, would cause us to die out as a as a species within a few months. I mean, they're absolutely fundamental to our our food production, to our waste disposal, to the health of our ecosystems. I mean, insects are uh, hugely important to us, and yet we treat them with disdain, or we consider them to be pointless a lot of the time. So we need to show we care. We need to show that they are important to us, that we value them and that uh, we need them around. It's not just a question of swatting away flies. It's, it's supporting creatures that provide you with chocolate <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, cranberries and, um, you know, all the melons and all these other kind of things that you, you like to eat. So, um, yeah, I think we do need to show we care. We need some really big changes and we need some kind of small incremental day-to-day -day changes too. I think it is possible we can do it because insects are the great survivors. They predated the dinosaurs. They, they outlived the dinosaurs. They show they can get through tough times. Um, we just need to give them a helping hand to do so. Okay, well, let me do one quick follow-up from that list that you had in that quote there, and that is generate energy. What do we have to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? Well, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, that's that's the kind of number one thing we need to do as a planet, probably, uh, beyond anything else that's going on in the world at the moment. Um, we're seeing kind of our addiction to fossil fuels is causing huge problems, as we're seeing flowing from the war in Ukraine and the, the kind of gas prices and what's happened there. Um, but more broadly, it's causing the heating of the planet that's, um, you know, destroying ecosystems, driving extinctions, uh, causing heat waves and flooding and so on to, to humans. Um, so we need to stop burning fossil fuels. Uh, we need to transition to uh, cleaner energy. Um, and that will help um, that will help insects and it will help very much help ourselves. Antonia, what's on your list of things we got to stop doing and things we got to start doing? Well, there are, certain, there are lots of things that we can actually do as individuals. I mean, if you have a garden or even a balcony, plant native plants. Uh, that's one of the, not simple things, but that's one of the things that, you know, you can do as individual person. Don't use pesticides, because that's, of course, killing insects. Um, go for a walk, be curious, learn about the insects around you. Um, contribute to conservation efforts. Uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, for example, is um, preserving habitats. Those are very important. Um, also, take pictures of insects. Contribute to the information for scientists to use. Use There's an app called iNaturalist that's wonderful. Um, it will help you to identify those insects or even other species. That sounds um, like a good list. It, it is. 
visit museums, you know, <laughs> support your natural history research. Says the lady um, who works at the Royal Ontario uh, Museum. Course. There you go. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Um, but I agree with Oliver. Everything that we can do to stop or slow down climate change is important, um, as well as, you know, um, reducing that impact that we have on um, land use. Mm. So um, stop trying to take over all of the meadows and all of the forests. Okay, good list. Heather, why don't you get the last word here? What's on your list of stop doing this and start doing this? Well, I think like start to pay attention to all the areas that insects can use as habitat. So again, as we mentioned, so like planting native plants, but also thinking about the amount of salt that we're putting onto our roadways in the winter, which is coming up. And so the salt feeds into the waterways and is killing aquatic um, insects. Thinking about the type of lighting that we're using in urban environments, because that's having a huge impact, all the lighting we have on insects in terms of their behavior, in terms of their mating. So that's hugely important. I will say that um, voting is a huge issue or a huge way that you can um, have a say and think about who best represents your interests and think about who is thinking about environmental issues, who's thinking about what can do what we can do for insects. And so, you know, we had a really low voter turnout last week in our municipal elections in Ontario. So make sure you get out and vote and do your research on the candidates. That has a huge impact. Again, think about the new legislation that's coming in for housing and how that's going to impact all the insect habitats. Um, and then put pressure on our federal government to have higher or more stringent policy in terms of protecting species at risk. So there's a lot of things that we can do as individuals, both in terms of how we vote and in terms of how we manage the, the urban environments that we're living in right now. Those are some good to-do lists that you have sent us away to do our homework with. So my thanks to all three of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Antonia Guidotti from the Royal Ontario Museum, Heather Caruba from the University of Ottawa, Oliver Millman, more on this in his book, The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. Thanks so much, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, November 1st, 2022. Tomorrow, why the war in Ukraine means new strategic thinking in Canada's far north. Also, David Frum on the coming U.S. midterm elections. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.